Hello and welcome to chapter 7. This is going to be problem number 3. And I chose problem number 3 because it allows me to talk about the sampling distributions, uh, specifically here for x bar, but I'm also going to mention the sampling distribution for p hat. And it also allows me to talk about the central limit theorem. So let's go ahead and start with the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Um, and again, the distribution of x bar is another way of talking about the sampling distribution of x bar. Um, and it's called the sampling distribution because it's the distribution of the sample statistic. Specifically here, it's going to be of the sample mean. So let's be given that the mean of x is mu, and that is the mean of the population x is mu, and the standard deviation of x, again, the standard deviation of the entire population is sigma, then these two relations are correct. Uh, the mean of x bar, the mean of the sampling distribution of x bar is mu. Notice the mean of x bar and the mean of x are exactly the same. Two, the standard deviation of x bar is equal to the standard deviation of x divided by the square root of n. Now, this is interesting because as the sample size increases, square root of n also increases, which means that sigma divided by the square root of n goes to 0, which means that as the sample size increases, our estimate of mu is going to become more and more precise. So this is distribution of x bar. It's going to have mean mu, standard deviation, sigma over square root of n. Now for this, the distribution of p hat, sampling distribution of the sample proportion, um, let's be given that x is binomial with n and p as usual, then the expected value or the mean of p hat, the mean of the distribution of p hat, is going to equal p. p is the proportion in the population. It's the success probability or the proportion or whatever you want to refer it to. So again, the expected value of p hat is going to be the true value p. So it's unbiased. Two, the standard deviation of p hat is going to be the square root of p times 1 minus p divided by n. Now again, notice as n increases, as our sample size increases, the standard deviation goes to 0, which means that our mu sub p hat is going to become a more and more precise estimate for p. Standard deviation of p hat is p times 1 minus p over n. Expected value of p hat is p. Now, the third thing we're going to talk about is the central limit theorem. And there are a lot of ways of, of saying this. This is the most, uh, this is the simplest, and it gets at what central limit theorem really is about. So let's assume that the variance of x is finite. And again, it's the variance of x that's in the population. So we're assuming that sigma squared is finite. Um, if that's true, then the distribution of x bar, the distribution of the sampling distribution of, uh, I'm sorry, the distribution of the sample mean, uh, approaches the normal distribution as sample size increases. Um, how big is big enough so that we can just use the normal distribution in all cases? Um, it depends on the distribution of x. If the distribution of x is approximately normal, then sample size of 30 or maybe 50, if you want to play it safe, is going to be good enough to where we can just use the normal approximation. If x starts out not normal by a lot, that is, it's heavily skewed, um, then you may want to go with 100 or maybe up to 500 for a uh, sample size before you can use the normal distribution. Um, but that's it. So distribution of x bar, distribution of p hat, and the central limit theorem. And the reason the central limit theorem is brought up here is because with this distribution of x bar, I don't talk about the actual name for the distribution of x. If the x is normally distributed, then x bar is going to be normally distributed. If x is approximately normally distributed, then x bar is going to be approximately normally distributed. And that approximation is going to get better and better as n increases. And as for the distribution of p hat, well, x has a binomial distribution, which is not normal. Therefore, the distribution of p hat is going to be approximately normal. And that approximation is going to get better and better as the number of trials or the sample size or whatever n refers to as that increases. 
So large n here makes this distribution of p hat more and more normal. And that's where the central limit theorem comes in. Again, notice the distribution of x bar itself has nothing to do with the, uh, it's only about the mean and the standard deviation. It's the central limit theorem that says it's going to be approximately normal. All right, let's get on to uh, the problem. And here it is, problem number three. We got some blah, blah, blah here. We're hypothesizing that mu exceeds 42. And mu, since it's mu, it's the population mean. To test that, we're looking at the sample mean, x bar. Um, we hypothesize that mu is equal to 42, and we're going to find out why in the, in the near future. We get a sample of 65, measure this sample mean to be 42.95. We're going to assume that sigma, the standard deviation of the population, is known, and it's 2.64. So we've got three numbers here that are pretty important, four numbers. We got mu equals 42. We have sigma equals 2.64. We have n equals 65. And we have x bar is 42.95. We can look at the data if we wish. Just click on that, open it in Excel. Here's the data. Really no need to look at the data because if you check, you highlight all 65 values, and down here you see the average actually is 49.9538, which is close enough to 42.95. So let's fill in the blanks. Mu is equal to, well, mu equals 42. Sigma is equal to 2.64. Mu sub x bar is always going to be equal to mu, 42. How do we know that? mu sub x bar is always going to be equal to mu. mu uh, sigma sub x bar? Well, sigma sub x bar is just sigma divided by the square root of n. In this case, sigma is equal to 2.64. n is equal to 65. So to calculate sigma sub x bar, we'll go ahead and do this calculation in Excel. This is going to equal 2.64, which is sigma, divided by the square root, SQRT, of 65. N is 65. 32745 to four decimal places, 3275. Notice that sigma of x bar is less than sigma. And now we calculate the probability. We use the techniques from chapter 6. x bar is normally distributed. It's got mean of 42, standard deviation of 0.3275. We need to calculate the probability that x bar is greater than 42.95. Refer back to chapter 6. Here's what it will be. It's equal to 1 minus dist norm. What goes in there first is going to be the 42.95. Then we put in the mean, which is 42. Then we put in the standard deviation, which is 0 0.3275. Uh, and then finally, we follow it up with true. And it's 1 minus that, because this is a greater than or equal to. Were this less than or less than or equal to, we wouldn't need the 1 minus. Of course, it's probably norm.dist. There we go. Norm.dist instead of dist.norm. 00186. Again, we're going to have to round it to four decimal places. 0019. That's it. The mu and the sigma were given to you in the problem. Mu sub x bar is always going to equal mu. Sigma sub x bar is always going to equal sigma divided by the square root of n. n was 65, the sample size. And then calculating this probability, we just use the techniques from chapter 6. b, if mu equals 42, what percentage of all possible sample means are greater than or equal to 42.95? It's what percentage. 
So we need to just change this into a percent, 0.19 percent. And notice that's a really small proportion, or a percent. It's less than our 0 0.05, or it's less than our 5 percent. So we have two possible conclusions we can draw. Conclusion one is that mu actually does equal 42, and we just got unlucky with our sample. Our sample was incredibly odd. Now the probability of observing data like this, or a sample like this, given our assumptions are true, is incredibly small. It's 0.19 percent. So I'm going to say that that's not the correct conclusion here. Option two is that one of our assumptions is incorrect. And most likely, the assumption that's incorrect is that mu is equal to 42. In fact, because our sample mean is greater than 42, and because this probability is so small, we're going to conclude that mu is actually greater than 42. We know mu doesn't equal 42, because what we observed would be so rare if mu did equal 42. And that's actually the first step to hypothesis testing. We make hypothesis. We collect data. We determine the probability of observing data like this, or more extreme, given that the null hypothesis is true. And then we can compare that value, that percentage, which we're going to eventually call a p-value. We compare that p-value to alpha, 0 0.05. And if p is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. We conclude that we made a, a faulty assumption somewhere. If p is greater than alpha, then we do not reject the null hypothesis. We don't accept it. We never accept the null hypothesis. But we don't reject it. We just conclude that 42 were this proportion that I'm pointing at now greater than 0.05. We would, conclu we would conclude that 42 is a reasonable value for mu. But since this value, this, this percentage that I'm pointing at, the 0 0.0019, is so small, we conclude that mu uh, 42 is not reasonable for mu. In fact, we conclude that mu is greater than 42. And that's it for this problem. Go ahead and submit it. Hopefully we got 10 out of 10. We got 10. Awesome. So hopefully this was helpful. Remember, once again, the most important parts of this was the sampling distribution of x bar for this problem. For other problems, it would be the sampling distribution of p hat, the proportion, and then the central limit theorem. The only thing the central limit theorem does is it tells us that mean distribution of means tends towards normal as the sample size increases. Take care of yourselves. Bye.